The National Broadcasting Company, in conjunction with the Fund for Adult Education, presents Democracy in America by Alexis de Tocqueville. Well, Tocqueville, what are you thinking about as you stare at these picturesque shores? Are you thinking about America? About America? No. I do not see America. I see more than America. I am trying to make out the image of democracy itself, with its inclinations, its prejudices, and its passions. Where could I be better off? A study in Jacksonian America. Item one in the series Democracy in America. Prepared by the Division of General Education of New York University under the direction of George Probst, American historian. A series designed to bring to life the America of 1831 as recorded by Alexis de Tocqueville and so to illuminate the image of democracy itself. A study in Jacksonian America. Where could I be better off? The month of May, 1831. The president, Old Hickory, General Andrew Jackson. And this is New York City. Over 200,000 people live here. Across the clear, fresh water of the East River, we look at Brooklyn, New York's dairy, a countryside of breezy heights and pasture land and cows. And looking across the beach is a New York clam dealer in an orange check waistcoat, tight-fitting gray gaiters, and a plug hat as tall and stately as a belfry with rips in the sides as if to let the noise of the bells out. Clams, choice clams, here's your Rockaway Beach clams, fine sand clams. But his mind is on the New York Consolidated Lottery. To be had in the greatest variety of lucky numbers at Arnold, 313 Broadway, opposite the Masonic Hall. Ten years ago, the state legislature had forbidden the famous old New York lotteries, but the proprietors are still finding loopholes to satisfy their customers who swarm through the bright May streets to produce the busiest community that any man could desire to live in. <laughs> in the streets, all is hurry and bustle. The very carts, instead of being drawn by horses at a walking pace, are often met at a gallop and always in a brisk trot. Omnibuses are racketing and terry-hooting through the New York streets with as much hubbub, hullabaloo, and general unmitigated uproar as the most optimistic man might expect in a city seven times the size. Get up there, team! Get up, team! Out of the way there, Mr. Come up! It is May the 11th, 1831. And on the deck of the fine steamboat president, just coming into New York Harbor, there stand two young men, both well-dressed, although both seem very tired. They have been without sleep for some time. They are surrounded by luggage, and they glance back and forth, the sights, as if they were strangers from another planet that had never seen the Earth before. They are strangers, come from France to see this curious new land that is supposed to be a democracy. This one, age 26, is Alexis Charles-Henri Clarel de Tocqueville, son of a French count. As for the harbor and the city itself, well, picture to yourself an attractively varied shoreline, the slopes covered by lawns and trees, in bloom right down to the water. And more than all that, an unbelievable multitude of country houses, big as boxes of candy. I am much struck by how convenient these little houses must be, and by the attractive air they give the countryside. Such is our impression of the city of New York. Beside the young Mr. de Tocqueville stands his great friend, also a French nobleman, but three years older. This young man, wearing a cloak, is 29. His name is Gustave Auguste de la Bonniniere de Beaumont. At each instant, you glimpse great bays which cut into the shores and form the most picturesque sides. We were full of real admiration. What struck us particularly was the animation given this majestic tableau by the immense number of vessels, brigs, gondolas, and boats of all kinds which cross and recross in every direction. Tocqueville and Beaumont plunge into the crowd as though into a bath and are lost in the tumult of activity and motion. The carriages rattle through the streets, the carts dance as if they were running races with them, and the ladies trip along in all the colors of the rainbow. Lord, Mabel, skip into that door right smart or I declare that carriage is going to splash our skirts. <laughs> 
And as for the passers-by, they look as though they actually had something to do. Now I tell you what it is. Pardon me. I'm going to let you in on the ground floor of this development. I'm going to let you, excuse me, take an option in the purchase of some real first-rate, pardon me, Western Pennsylvania speculations. Basically, it's a granite quarry, uh, pardon, which can Watch be... Watch where you're going. Ma'am, I'm sorry. So am I. Now, basically, like I say, the investment is a granite quarry that's financing an India rubber company, all, excuse me, joint stock, and all enterprise, all pure enterprise, excuse me, if you want to make money... Now... Everybody is walking as if he were in a hurry. Well, if you want to find your way around this country, you'll have to hurry. We firmly believe that if a man means business, he better look as if he meant business. We Americans are born in a hurry and educated at speed. We make a fortune with a wave of a wand and lose it just as fast, and then remake and relose the whole thing in a twinkling of an eye. Our body is a locomotive ripping along at 30 miles an hour. Our spirit is a high-pressure engine. Our life resembles a shooting star, and death surprises us like an electric shock. The governor of the state of New York, Mr. Throop, looks through his boarding house window at everybody in motion and observes... They all seem as if they were running away from an indictment. And Governor Throop draws out a toothpick and continues to enjoy the May morning and watches the hogs happily rooting around in the gutters, indulging in hearty repasts of awful of every description. And this, too, in the midst of coaches, horses, and pedestrians. Cholera. That's what you're going to get. Cholera. That's what you're asking for right here in New York City. I wouldn't give you more than a dog's chance. Well, experience, sir, has proven that the most efficacious and powerful method of keeping the streets of a town in a state of perfect and refined cleanliness is plenty of hogs. And if the hogs aren't doing the trick, then you haven't got enough of them. <laughs> Or in 1831, New York City, with its 200,000 people and 11 daily newspapers, is very unequal in style and quality from one district to another. The great avenue of Broadway is striking from its continuous and unbroken length of three miles in a straight line. But its breadth, about 80 feet, is not sufficiently ample for the due proportion to its length. It is, moreover, wretchedly paved. And as for 3rd Avenue and 8th Avenue, these are no more than long muddy lanes leading respectively to the remote villages of Harlem and Manhattanville. But New York is now and always has been a port, a city of ships. The side-wheel steamers with their long flaring funnels like post-boys trumpets lie side by side with the forested sailing ships whose long bowsprits hang over the passers-by like sabers at a wedding. We must quickly find a boarding house and get some sleep. Do these people never stay still? Look how they chase along the streets. Everyone seems to be afraid to let the next man get ahead of him. And indeed, an American is always on the lookout lest any of his neighbors get the better of him. If 100 Americans were going to be shot, they would contend for the priority. So strong is our habit of competition. Look, Beaumont, over there. It must be some kind of parade. In the early 1830s, New York was a city of parades. Here's Major Downing. He calls himself a major from the state of Maine. He says he's from Maine, rode in one of those parades with the seventh president himself, Andrew Jackson himself, old hickory in person and none other. At least he says he did. I like to meet the man that'd disbelieve me to my face with my glass in my hand. Uh, you tell him, Major. If you'd been out that day, you'd have seen me in the general figure in considerable large, I guess. There never was anything like it in New York afore. I'll swear to that, Major. There's many an accomplished liar sitting outside the tavern drinking his whiskey and telling his stories, though certainly the great men are a great deal more accessible now in 1831 than they ever became later. One thing strikes me at once. What is that? Look at the people. Look at their general ease. Most of them seem well fed. Most of them seem well dressed. This is a country where men live well by the work of their hands. Irish laborers, straight off the boat, get as much as 75 cents a day. Together with lodging, three big meals a day, and six to eight glasses of whiskey, depending on the state of the weather. Bread, meat, sugar, tea, fuel are cheaper than in the old country, and wages are triple. 
The stores are full of things, some startling enough to horrify the casual visitor. We observe the open sale of Dirks, Bowie knives, and a long kind of stiletto called the Arkansas toothpick. These are sold by druggists in whose shops or stores these deadly weapons are hung up for public inspection and sold by them as part of the legitimate wares of their calling, thus plainly indicating that weapons to kill, as well as medicine to cure, could be had at the same shop. <laughs> A city of green trees and fresh paint. A lively, new, sparkling city for all its roughness and vigor. Towards each other, the citizens are forthright and breezy, as when the clam dealer calls on the governor of the state. Hello there. Brought some fresh clams for the governor. Hey, sitting in the parlor, picking his teeth. Go right in. Hello there, Mr. Garrick. Step right in. Morning, Mr. Governor. Brought you some clams. Well, that's just fine. Pull up a chair and bite yourself off a chew. One man's as good as another, if not better, and people don't forget that elected officers are nothing but their servants. Towards women, however, the attitude is usually very different. There are no women around here. The females are ladies, should be treated accordingly, as the precious repositories and fair blossoms of virtue, beauty, and high morality. And anyone who suggests these dainty creatures should have their innocence sullied by too much education or the toil of commercial or political affairs deserves the active opprobrium of all decent men. Equality and easy manners, then, and pride. Such pride. Boasting is a virtue, and a good boaster is a man to be admired. When the ancient, respectable, and patriotic Tammany Society celebrates its 42nd anniversary tomorrow, May 12th, I shall propose the toast to democracy, the finest institution devised by the mind of man, especially suited for the greatest people on earth, the fortunate inhabitants of the greatest country on earth, under God's special protection, America. Equality, boasting, and business. This is a city of merchants and men of affairs. Even in the streets full of hurrying people, business goes on as usual. I'll go 30 cents a pound. I can't cover the cost of shipping at that price. 32. That takes up all my profit. You do better than that now with your markup. There's overhead charges. 30 and a half. If that's what I'll make it, 30 and a half. And yet, amid the bustle, there are some who sit calm. Like this old gentleman here with a white beard and whiskers and the clean-shaven top lip. He's reading the mercantile advertiser at the foot of Cortland Street and seems undisturbed by the bustle. Uh, what bustle? This is the 11th of May. You've been here the 1st of May, you've seen some bustle. Well, why the 1st of May? What's so special about that? Why, New York City, the 1st of May is moving time. Well, how do you mean, moving time? Time, a uh, universal flitting. Time when everybody moves. People here are very locomotive in their habits. They are anxious to better themselves, see? It's the day of all others in the year when the good people of this town have one and all agreed to play at the game of move all. First of May, they're all at it with all their might. Second of May, everything will be quiet. They'll all be settled again. Did you move the first of May? I most certainly did. I moved every May day for the last 40 years. Everybody does the same. People can't bear not to be like their neighbors. Or it takes a live fish to swim upstream. Well, good day, dear. Nice fresh day. And it is a nice fresh day, perhaps a little too fresh. For down here by the water, there's quite a wind. Look at that poor lady, tacking along with the wind behind her skirts and flounces. A lady has a time of it when the wind blows and the dust is flying in clouds, as it does in New York almost all day long. I encountered a puff at the corner of one of the streets, and there I stood holding my hat with one hand and my cardinal cloak, which has 56 yards of various commodities in it, with the other I thought I should have gone up like a balloon and stood stark still until I came near being run over by a great hog which was scampering away from some mischievous boys. At last, a sailor took compassion on me and set me down at the door of a store. As he went away, I heard him say to his companion, Damn my eyes, Bill. What a press of canvas the girls carry nowadays. This lady is not the only one to complain of the wind, for as we near the waterfront, we see the air full of plug hats and people chasing after them. Catch it! Catch it! Don't step on it, you confounded blockhead! But particularly notice this. See the pieces of paper sailing about, together with a variety of vegetables, pieces of linen and other materials, entirely interrupting the view. Where does all this come from? Is it garbage? No, sir, it is not. All those commodities come from hats. 
And no nation on earth uses a hat for so many purposes as a Yankee. It serves him at once for a head covering, a writing desk, a larder, and a portmanteau. In it, the merchant deposits patterns of various descriptions. The doctor uses it as an apothecary's shop. The married man, returning from market, converts it into a depository for potatoes and other vegetables. And to the traveller, it serves as a knapsack. Look, 66 Broadway. Room for rent. A boarding house. Eighteen thirty-one. Now let me see. I was in New York City at the time. My husband had gone to his long reward. He used to work as a speculator, trading in commodities. You know, you can make a lot of money that way. He didn't, but he sure tried hard. A fine man. I guess that's what killed him. So I opened a refined boarding house for ladies and gentlemen of standing and position. Number 66 Broadway, just down the street from the American Hotel. These two French gentlemen came in off the steamship president, and I never saw two fellas look more tired. They just rolled into their beds in the middle of the afternoon, and I guess they must have slept clean through until 8 o'clock next morning, when I told Kitty to ring for breakfast. All right, Kitty. All the cold meats are on, and the lobsters will be ready in a moment. Might as well let them have the gong as soon as it's 8 o'clock. Yes, ma'am. All right, Kitty, let them have it. Morning, ma'am. You any studying last night? I reckon I did. I've just about proved that the Babylon of the Apocalypse refers to the Scarlet City of London, England. Mr. Griggs from Kentucky. Very keen Bible student, though just a piece biased about proving England's downfall. Good morning, Marquis. Good morning, madam. I hope you passed a good night, Marquis. In the wrongs of my unhappy country. Get the bagwig and the raffles. That gentleman's a real French marquis. That's the way they call it. I believe right now the marquis is teaching dancing to young ladies of refinement and... Morning, Major General. Morning, ma'am. You look fit as a fiddle this fine morning, sir. An old soldier usually comes out pretty fit, ma'am. The Major General's from Vermont. A regular walk-in encyclopedia about the war, if you ask me. Morning, Mr. O'Brien. Good morning, ma'am. One moment, Mr. O'Brien. I wondered if we might have something on account on that little bill. Well, I tell you, ma'am, I've got a job this morning at the Hudson River docks checking consignments. And whatever I get, you can have half of it. No, you can't say fairer than that. I'd rather have the whole of it. But you can't say too much to the poor fella with his ribs all sticking out. He has to stand up twice to cast a shadow. A lot of Irish gentlemen are over here to live cheap, even though it cost them a year's wages to get here. Morning, Mr. Beasley. Morning, ma'am. Any luck yesterday? I thought I saw one of them over near the courthouse, but it gave me the slip. Well, I hope and trust you have better luck today. Mr. Beasley is from the Carolinas, indigo planter. He's up here on business and keeping his eye open for half a dozen of his slaves that ran away. He's heard tell they're in New York City at present. I hope he can make those slaves realize that every time they run away, they deprive a gentleman of his lawful property. Morning, gentlemen. Morning, madam. Good morning. Now, let me see. Which of you gentlemen is which? I am Mr. de Tocqueville, and this is Mr. de Beaumont. Mr. Tocqueville's the little one. Mr. Beaumont's the big one. Well, I, I hope I can remember that. And you gentlemen are from France? That is perfectly correct. Well, you can't start the day on an empty stomach. And you will if you don't step lively. Why, it must be five past eight if it's a minute. The gong here goes at eight o'clock, you know. And I wouldn't answer for there being many vittles on the board by quarter after. Then we had better hurry. Sit wherever you like. If there's any left, there's fish, ham, beef, four fowls, eggs, pigeons, pumpkin pies, lobsters... Vegetables, tea, coffee, cider, sangaree, and cherry brandy. Oh, uh, we, we, we can sit here. Yes. Uh, beef? Thank you. Potatoes? Thank you. Cabbage? No, thanks. Coffee? No, not at this time in the morning. I'll have brandy. 
Dumont, look at the ladies. It is also too early in the morning to look at ladies. No, no, I'm serious. You notice they are completely dressed for the day. Everything complete and finished. And here it is only breakfast. At this rate, a lady would be ready to receive visitors at nine o'clock in the morning. Things will be very different here in America. See how fast you must eat. This food is melting away before our eyes. Uh, more beef? Thank you. Uh, more potatoes? Thank you. Oh, some of them are leaving already. Certainly there seems to be very little formality in a democracy. Then you and I shall gobble our breakfast as though we were Americans and hurry out to see the marvels of New York. Let me see, uh, where are we? This is the Bowery. And this is Bayard Street. Now, look at that hotel. Huh? The North American Hotel. One, two, three, four, five floors. And an exchange table Never attached. mind that. Look at the roof. What I want you to notice Would is... I do mind it. I want to notice everything and make, make look, a note. Look on the roof beside where the American flag is flying. There is a wooden statue of a poor boy with ragged knees and elbows. Oh. Now, why should the management put such a thing on their roof? Surely there must be some instructive story connected with it? Yes, sir, there surely is. Oh, and you'll find it's a tale of American industry, American opportunity, and American courage. Are those things abundant here? Sir, those virtues and many others besides are always found in America and never found in other countries. <clears throat> now, sir, 38 years ago, a poor boy came to this town, a poor Yankee boy, named David Reynolds. He was 12 or 14 years of age at the time, without a crust of bread to feed him, without a copper in his pocket. Weary and hungry, he leaned against a fine elm tree, since cut down, made into lumber, and sold at a good price. That elm tree stood where the North American Hotel now stands. While young David Reynolds was leaning against it, luxuriating, you might say, in his beautiful shade, he racked his little brains to try and devise some means of procuring for the sustenance of his childish needs a livelihood that should be both honest and honorable. While he was thus reflecting how to get his dinner, a gentleman came up to him... Name? I beg your pardon, sir. I wondered if you knew this gentleman's name. <clears throat> this gentleman's name, sir, has not been handed down to posterity. Oh. May I proceed? Pray do. Thank you, sir. The gentleman whose name has not been transmitted to us approached this poor friendless boy and asked if he were willing to carry the gentleman's trunk down to the wharf. The boy eagerly consented and received for his labors the sum of 20... 25 cents. Now, what do you suppose he did with it? Spent it on food. Perhaps he reserved some to pay for his night's lodging. Or was he prepared to sleep in the street? He was prepared to do anything, sir, providing it was honest. I'll tell you what he did. He did an American thing. With a little of the money, he bought food. And with the rest of it, he bought fruit, which he offered for sale beneath that same elm tree. American initiative, sir, grasping the opportunity. He soon disposed of his little stock to advantage and spent that night richer than he had ever been before. On the morrow, he repeated the transaction. Soon, he had a fruit stall under the tree, then a small shop, then several houses on either side. Finally, he acquired such an estate that he pulled it all down and built this magnificent hotel. On this plaque, which he caused to be erected, he has set out his own story. And you will perceive it concludes with these words. The tree was cut down, but from its beloved trunk he caused his image to be carved. That's it up there. As a memento of his own forlorn beginnings and his grateful recollections. From a penniless, ragged boy, David Reynolds rose to be one of the most prosperous citizens in his community and the owner of the finest hotel in New York City, and possibly the world. That, sir, is an American story, and I myself am David Reynolds at your service. Sir, I'm enchanted to make your acquaintance. Delighted. 
But tell me this. Do not your fellow citizens hold against you in some way these humble origins of yours? <laughs> they do not, sir. Most emphatically not. I am a man of property and position. And in New York, that speaks for itself. Oh, uh, I trust, by the way, gentlemen, that you are yourselves not in need of lodgings, because if you are... No, thank I, you, uh... sir. We are already accommodated. And in any case, we must very shortly leave the city. We hear New York is not America, and we want to see all the country. You should see it all. The finest country in the world. Ask any American, and he'll tell you, where could I be better off? Goodbye, gentlemen. And remember that little American story. I think he is right. That is an American story. A poor boy rising to be a large property owner, enjoying the respect of his community. But chiefly because of his money. Perhaps it is the symbol of position, as blood is with us. This is indeed a new world. And one to which we had better become accustomed. I am going to find out about this place, Beaumont, because I think in this country we can perceive something of the future of our own. Democracy? Yes. America is only my setting. Democracy is my subject. It appears to me, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that sooner or later we shall arrive, like the Americans, at an almost complete equality of condition. But first, we must collect the facts. We must dissect American society and search out the elements of which it is composed. We must ask useful questions. The smallest conversations will be instructive. There is not a man, on whatever rung of society he finds himself, who cannot teach me something. You have just heard, Where Could I Be Better Off? A Study in Jacksonian America. Item one in a series based on Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America. This series, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, was prepared by the Division of General Education of New York University under the direction of George Probst, American historian. Produced in the studios of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation by Andrew Allen, script by Lister Sinclair, music by Lucio Agostini. This series, Democracy in America, is made possible by a grant from the Fund for Adult Education as part of a general course of study of the nature of American society. For information about the use of these de Tocqueville dramatizations for study or discussion and how to secure these new materials about American democracy at a reasonable charge, write to the American Foundation for Continuing Education, Post Office Box 749, Chicago 90, Illinois. Now, this is Ben Grower inviting you to join us next week for Item 2, The Governor in the Boarding House, on Democracy in America. Wherever you travel in the USA, stay well informed. Tune to Radio NBC.